Hi Ed, great to speak with you today. I've certainly enjoyed reading Pharma Loss and it's been, uh, I have to say, quite an inspiration for me with Pharma Forum. So, how did it all begin? Well, first, thanks for having me here. It's great to see you again. And um, how did it start? Well, I had been working as a, a business writer for the Star Ledger of New Jersey, which uh, is the big newspaper in the in the region between New York and Philadelphia, and I'd been covering the pharmaceutical industry for about, oh, I want to say a dozen years, and there was really nowhere else for me to go within that organization, although I continued to like the subject matter. It's getting antsy, and uh, at the same time, this is obviously, uh, if people can recall, when newspapers were beginning to wobble with the advent of the internet. And so the editor of the paper was looking for internet ideas because the ledger is actually owned by the Newhouse family, which owns a gazillion magazines. Some of the titles people probably would recognize immediately is Vanity Fair, Wired, Architectural Digest, The New Yorker, and they have a newspaper unit off in another sphere. And so uh, there was always a lot of interest in getting something going, and pharmaceuticals, of course, are global. So when I raised my hand effectively and said, I've got an idea, everybody effectively said, okay, let's figure out what to do. And so there was a, a, about a year of uh, what I call marinating <laughs> until we could design it. Everyone had uh, you know, a chance to argue about it. And we uh, launched it in January of 07. And uh, as part of that, though, I stopped writing for the paper because I decided to do this right. Really ought to see if we could just get some momentum going, not just do something once a day or twice a day or twice a week, but to effectively put a stream of information on the site, and uh, I never looked back. I've been doing it almost five years, with, with an interruption in between. And what kind of audience do you see actually visiting the site now? What do you think makes it so popular? Well, it, it's, it's, I think it's still pretty much the same audience. First, I'll give, try to give um, uh, a way of, of viewing that audience or thinking about that audience. If, if you were to imagine concentric circles, and the big the center circle would be pharmaceutical industry, and that would include you know, however many people, regardless of the headcount today versus a year or two ago, but it would include people at all levels and all different functions. So it would be from top, you know, not, maybe not all the way to the bottom, but um, going from the C-suite sort of level on down, and then of course carve it up between marketing, legal, finance, regulatory, R&D. And then from there, the outlying circles would include, however you want to construct them, people who work with pharma. And that would be consultants and advertising agencies and Wall Street firms and uh, physicians and people who follow pharma for a work-related reason. So you have academics, you have... Uh, patient advocacy groups, consumer advocacy groups. You know, I'm forgetting a whole bunch. You know, the law firms in there, in one of those circles, and then the 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 outer ring would be consumers. You know, the average person, because farm a lot is not behind a paywall. Anybody can come to the party. I think the first couple of years, coincidentally, there were. Pro I, I I don't have the statistics to measure this because we've all, we've gotten better at gathering this information. But I think there are probably at least in terms of the comments, or commenters, they're probably a higher visible percentage of people from the consumer world at that time. And that in part reflected the fact that the industry itself was mired in controversy over antidepressants and antipsychotics and the marketing and the litigation. That was a regular headline, if you will. That's abated in the last couple of years or more. Uh, not gone away, but not to the extent that it was a fresher sort of uh, issue. So I think that the consumers still come and go, but I don't think that the um, it's as obvious. So it's, it's weighted more the last couple of years toward people who are concerned with what the industry is doing and, and that, sort, that sort of thing, but um, more from the inside than the outside, I think. There's a lot going on, as you know, within pharma right now. So how do you actually choose which stories to focus on? Well, there's two methods to my strange madness. One is, I'm, I'm just one guy. I'd like to say when I created Farm a lot, I set up this newsroom, but I'm still the only one in the newsroom. So that means I can do just so many things. And um, 
I want to I want to be able to focus on areas that one I can I can sort out what I think is is interesting and bring something to the table and two um, because I'm just one person I, I I have to be realistic and recognize limitations so there are already teams of, of journalists at Bloomberg Reuters Dow Jones who can cover so many bases all day long, all year long, that I can't get to on my own. So that forces me to zig when the others zag. So I'm not going to spend my time trying to specialize in biotech stocks and what's making the stocks go up, down, sideways, looking to see um, you know, the latest um, business alliances, one after the other. I mean, you, you have specialty publications such as the pink sheet here in the US that do that sort of thing uh, already so if, if I can't if, if I can't effectively compete as one guy in my little newsroom what can I do that's of value and so by default and also by design I, I it, and it's it wasn't something I planned but it, it's morphed or, or sort of gone in this direction by 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 uh, nature I look at I try to look at issues I try to look at um, stories, items, posts, whatever word we use, that will help illustrate, if only incrementally, an ongoing issue that confronts the industry. Now, I do get into investor issues or issues pertaining to different companies, different drugs or different classes of drugs that have an obvious financial impact. I don't ignore that. I just don't specialize in that. And so I will look, though, as a result, I will look at marketing uh, not in addition to what we just mentioned, I would look at marketing issues. I'd look at legal issues and regulatory issues, um, and uh, also issues that speak to how the industry more broadly uh, conducts its its practices, because that has been such a hot button. Um, and uh, but you know, it's all wrapped together. It's all interconnected, obviously. So what happens, you know, as a result of the patent cliff affects how the companies cut back and where they invest their money and which areas of research and how they're going to shift the marketing dollars left over. So um, I'm trying to look at those broad things, uh, you know, one by one each day and hopefully give the reader, um, viewer, whatever they are, <laughs> a chance to figure out, uh, you know, what's going on uh, or at least come away with some, some insights. And one of the things that I quite like about Farmalot is that you're not afraid to voice your opinion, tell it how it is. But how do you get that balance right between fairly representing all sides of a story? Well, it's not easy because no matter what we do, uh, you know, you can relate to this running a site yourself. Um, there's always going to be someone who's going to nitpick or more, you know, more so say, well, uh, this is off base or why did you do that? First of all, in terms of how I write or present things, um, it may be hard to tell from my New York accent, but there was a time when I did some radio, just a little bit of radio. And what I learned from doing news writing for radio is that you got to be short, punchy, to the point. And I also worked at a tabloid before the Star Ledger, New York Newsday. So I learned a bit about headline writing, although I didn't do the headline writing, but I came to appreciate how my stories ended up being perceived on the newsstands. And so I try to use the same sort of style of writing for the site, because the the, the items, the stories, they're, they're, they're relatively short. I try to pack a lot in, but I try to make it, here's the key, conversational. So maybe some of the material is dense to some outsiders or people who are familiar with one slice of the pharma world, but less so the other. But I try to keep it simple enough. I try to again, keep it conversational so that if someone was listening to it being read, they may hopefully get enough of the gist as if they're turning on the radio and hearing the evening news. Now, the other part of your question, in terms of opinion or voice, I try very hard not to make the site about me, because at, at the end of the day, if it's perceived that it's too much of Ed Silverman's opinion, that will, I, I, I worry that it would wither away the audience. Uh, it might concentrate uh, a base of people, whatever that number is, that agree or like with what my opinion might be, but I would lose others. And I have no interest in losing people simply because I may have a different point of view about a topic, but maybe I'd share the same point as them the next topic that comes up. So there's really nothing in it for me to be wholly opinionated regularly. 
what I try to do as part of the conversational writing style is interject more colloquial language that gives people a chance to say, okay, I may not agree with the question he's presenting or the way he's presenting it, but I understand he's trying to get a point, and hopefully they're coming away with the notion that I'm trying to get them to think about something rather than think about what I have to say as my own point of view. And the only time that um, this argument becomes sticky is when people say, well, how come you choose to present certain issues but not other issues? You know, it's the areas of emphasis argument. That's fair. Uh, one, I can't do all things, as I mentioned before. Two, I do try to zig when others zag. And three, I'm a journalist. And I'm chronicling an industry undergoing change. And often, as a journalist, and I've been a business journalist 30 years, I, and covering other industries in, in the past, I've learned that a very good way to chronicle change is to look for those flashpoints, those points of tension, as I call them because that's usually illustrative of what's going on and why. And so people might sum that up in their own mind and say, well, something is sensational or it's going for the, the juicy headline. Really what I'm looking for is something that helps people understand what's going on and why. I may not succeed every time. They may say I chose the wrong topic or I didn't execute well, but that's my goal. And in doing that, I'm looking for ways to help them understand what's going on. And, um, Yes, I may look for stories about litigation at times because product liability has been a problem. Off-label promotion has been a problem. But those are problems that represent business practices that people want change, that are causing more interest not just from lawyers but from government. And that ultimately will lead to something different at the end of the day. How different, we don't know necessarily or entirely yet, but it's been happening. It has been playing out. So that's why... I look at those areas, but I also look at other areas concerning employment, pipeline, FDA, how the FDA conducts itself and its interactions with the industry, because that's just another way of chronicling all that sort of change in tension. Do you ever get people pushing back on stories, asking you to take them down? No, no one's ever said that to me directly. The um, I hear sometimes privately that uh, somebody complained you know, to their PR person and said, I don't like that. You know, you tell them to take it down. That was more in the early days when people didn't quite understand how the internet was functioning uh, or how a site like mine functioned. But the reality is it's, it's something I try to maintain as a journalist, as, as a vehicle for on the record or, 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 or you know, it's, it's of the record. And so, um, yeah, uh, there's some pushback sometimes. I mean, if I'm inaccurate, I've made a mistake. I want to know about it because I don't want it to sit out there indefinitely. So I'll go back and use a little strike bar um, or, I'm, or I do an update to clarify something. It makes it a little chewy for people to, to digest, but that's just the way it goes. And, and quite frankly, I think that's fairer than what newspapers used to do. They would put a correction you know, a day or a week later buried on page two or three. And the story is long forgotten and it's not connected physically or any other means. So quite frankly, I think my approach, and it's not that I didn't invent it, the internet allows us to do that, but I think that approach hopefully um, in, injects a, a degree of fairness that uh, is, is, is transparent and timely. And um, beyond that though, uh, yeah, the pushback I get is, oh, you know, you could see it in the comments. People will say, you forgot something, or you got this wrong. I get private emails like that, and I'll go back and use the strike bar, or I'll say, damn it, I screwed up. Uh, <laughs> what am I going to do to fix this? Um, but it doesn't happen very often. Generally, it's more a question of, well, you know, there's a study that's come out. You've attempted to summarize the study, but, you know, there's a history here uh, concerning the, the product or the data or the people doing the study. You know, that, that sometimes is a matter of opinion, open to interpretation. Statistics always are, it seems. But um, uh, that's fine. I, I'll, I'll engage people in the comment section when I think there's something that is incorrect or incomplete or could be done differently and better. Um, I think that's more useful because the media that we, the, the, the world we live in now involves media where there's this opportunity to shape uh, the information um, and not just, it's no longer a one-way street. A bunch of select people push it out and the rest of us digest it. No, I mean, 
this is the world I have to live in as a professional, and I have to be ready to engage. So if people are ready to engage me, fine. You know, let's just be productive about it. And I'd like to get your perspective on how well you think pharma manages its own PR and what it could maybe do better. Um, probably better than, I mean, I think the, most of the PR, and I've outlasted a number of them, sorry to say, but um, I think overall most of them probably do a better job than, than the credit they're given for doing because it is a difficult job. You know, the last several years, they're running out of new products. They're working for companies that each of the big ones, for better or worse, it's out there, we know. They've had problems with marketing um, and litigation attached to it. Uh, there have been promotional and pricing issues going back more than a decade, whether it's AIDS in South Africa or seniors in the northern United States taking a bus into Canada. You have people concerned about, I mentioned promotion, the way things are advertised. That's an awful lot of fires to put out on an ongoing basis. And it's not like you put out one and it goes away. They keep coming back. That Sometimes they all come up in the same week. Um, so I, I think that there's a lot, lot of... of, of uh, a lot of stuff they have to deal with. Now, some of it's of their own making, though, or it was of their own making. You know, maybe issues that we talk about today are more reflective of something that happened four or five or eight years ago. But um, it's not as if they woke up and suddenly bad things happened to them. You know, let's be, let's be straight. Some of these companies have had some people in there that have done things they shouldn't have done, and it's reverberated to affect everybody else. Um, so... That's something they have to live with, uh, for, you know, right or wrong. Um, and I think that, uh, you know, there's another aspect to this. It's, it's like anything else in, that's discussed with corporate America increasingly in the global recession is, you know, what about the C-suite? What about the CEOs and the boards? Are they, uh, you know, they really doing everything they should to um, ensure that there is um, equity toward their customers and their uh uh, employees, and I think that one of the things that PR people and the and the and the executives and the boards don't appreciate. I'm sort of going off on a tangent here, but we know that they have a, their first responsibility as a public company. Uh, a Beringer would not be an exa example of this, but uh, public companies have to respond to their shareholders. But you know, the, this how often do we see the CEOs really go out and address any of the other so-called stakeholders? And this is part of the PR. That's why I'm mentioning this. The companies say they have a message to, to deliver about curing, saving people, but the C CEOs most often spend their time managing the business, looking at the numbers, being concerned, and they, as they should. But does that mean they don't have time to also address the other stakeholders personally? Why not go out to patient forums? When's the last time there's ever you've heard of a CEO going to the American College of Cardiology conference? No, that's where the R&D guy goes. That's where the chief medical officer goes. That's where somebody else goes. Why not the CEO make a point of doing that? It rarely happens, rarely. Uh, I think Merck did that a couple of years ago when they had a problem down in Atlanta. I'm trying to remember the details. This is coming to me as I'm talking to you. But it's rare, and that was really to put out a fire. How about being proactive? How about addressing those stakeholders and going to um, um, other forums where they're patients, not just doctors? You know, Bill Weldon, when he had the crisis with J&J &J last year, is all very conventional, old-fashioned PR effort. Talk to Fortune, the Wall Street Journal. I think there was a, a TV segment. The only other public appearance the guy made was at Congress because they dragged him there. But if you really, and this is the company with a credo, if you really concern other stakeholders as a regular basis, get out there, show your face, there's more to all this than just the numbers. Because also at the end of the day, if you do these other things, there used to be the saying that if, I, think, I guess it was attributed to Merck, if you develop the right medicines, it will go... The people, will, the physicians the, and the patients will get what they need and the money will follow. Well, I think that's been forgotten and it doesn't take that much effort as part of the PR strategy, again, back to your question, to get out there and do that. So it's not just reacting to all these crises 
however recent or old they are, whether they are the making of a few people or an institutional problem. It's also a question of being more proactive and facing a new world and say, you know what? You can't just hide behind numbers and you can't just stay in boardrooms and limousines and, and, and helicopters from you know, meeting to meeting. You've got to get out there and justify why your stock is valuable, why you're more important, why your products are valuable. Because if you don't do that, it's not going to follow. Now, I realize I'm being simplistic and, you know, Wall Streeters will say that's not what it's about. I'm not negating what they feel is important. I agree with what they say. I think it's, it's what I'm trying to say is it's more than that. It, it's a bigger picture there. And that, that part of the PR strategy is lacking. And unfortunately, the PR people can't control it. How have you seen the focus of your content changing over time, Ed? What stories have faded away and what's really come into the spotlight? It's hard to say what's, what's dropped away. I think it's really more a question of what's been um, less intense. Five years ago when I started the site, we were still in the thrall of controversy over antidepressants, and side effects and clinical trial data, what was available, what was disclosed, what wasn't. The litigation was picking up, and that extended to other drugs or types of drugs. And every big company is in most of these had or, you know, a product, a big selling product. That, of course, also fed into the off label promotion investigations by this or that U.S. attorney. So that is. That's still out there. Just the other day, Glaxo had an agreement in principle for $3 billion to settle this sort of thing. Um, how many more of those big settlements we'll see is, you know, I'm sure we'll see. Uh, no one, I'm not willing to say that's the end, but, um, you know, certainly we've had a lot of that sort of thing. And I think that it's not new anymore that there has been concern about clinical trial data disclosure and side effects and safety as a result. Um, I, I wouldn't say that's fallen away, but it's no longer a new startling issue either. Um, whether people learn to live with it is another discussion. But um, I think that, you know, what, what we're getting at now, we're coming up is, um, you know, where does pharma direct its efforts? Uh, where does it invest the R&D? How likely is it to be successful? Um, and, then, and this cuts across a couple of other different related topics. Um, you know, do you go further into biologics? Do you look more at, um, you know, so besides oncology, you know, what else do you look at? Uh, how soon and to what extent do we need to invest in personalized medicine? And then a related issue, where are you going to put those dollars, not just in terms of research, but also geographically? The whole industry is shifting increasingly. Um, outside the, you know, what's been the traditional areas uh, in, in the U.S. and Western Europe. And, and that's going to change the way, um, to, to an extent, and it'll be slow, but it's going to change the way business is done. And it's going to require the drug makers to, the, and the decision makers to sort out you know, how they, they balance uh, the, the changing marketplace. And I think that is, is a huge story. It's playing out like anything else every day. It's a question of figuring out, you know, which moments in time, which particular events really signify, you know, what, what's happening. But I think that that's becoming a much more of a strategic story. Um, it's less, it's more investor and employment and regulatory and public policy sort of story than a consumer story, certainly. Now, one thing I've got to ask you is, if you had to pick one, what is the craziest story that you've ever reported on? Yeah, and this just because it was so strange and it generated so much traction. It was uh, three plus years ago, and it concerned Pfizer because the um, CEO at the time, Jeff Kindler, I guess most people who watch this will know who, that name, um, was um, trying to justify. I got wind that he was trying to justify some of the expenses that were. Um, being uh, absorbed to cover a few key employees, including the head of HR. And uh, this, this was part of a larger issue for him. And, and Fortune magazine had a piece this summer that included this. In fact, 
credited me for breaking this one item, one, one little strand of the craziness. But um, there was a, the HR person had um, been living in Delaware and was actually commuting between New York and Delaware, and the company was paying for it. And that adds up. Meanwhile, this company is announcing how many people it's going to chop. And, and, this is, and, and, and this person is an HR. So if any executive in the department is going to be sensitive to employee issues, not just having to do more work or different work with fewer people, HR should know this. Meanwhile, how much money was this person getting from Pfizer to go back and forth and there was really no need for this. And at the same time, Kinley was trying to figure out how do we, how do we um, you know, pay for this without, there was an internal discussion about the, the, uh, the tax treatment, the tax liability, and, and the fiduciary disclosure. So uh, at the end of the day, they had to change gears. But I got wind of this debate and the fact that this money was being spent as it was. And um, that was uh, you know, emblematic of some of the excess at, at the top, the disconnect, uh, you know, because also people are paying higher prices for drugs. And, and that's, again, a whole different stream of, 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 of rationale that we can pick through. But they're, they're hearing about this. So, and why was that crazy? Because, one, it was odd. I mean, things like this happen on a regular basis, unfortunately. People are what they are. That doesn't excuse it, doesn't justify it, but it's going to happen. The question is, how do you prevent it? How do you rein it in? What do you do when you find it? In this case, though, it happened, and I had hundreds uh, of comments. Uh, I think it broke a record, um, or it came close, because there was just phenomenal reaction to this. There was a lot of pent-up anger at Pfizer because of the way, you know, it's the big, cup, the big gorilla in the industry and other decisions made at the time. So that was kind of interesting, and um, you know, the HR exec never responded to me. Not surprisingly. And where does Formalot go from here then? Where do you see it developing in the future? Well, um, I'm not sure if this is pertinent enough, but I, I should say there have been some corporate ownership changes since we started the site, or I started the site, because back in 07 when we launched, it was owned by the Star Ledger of New Jersey that I mentioned earlier, and I was a regular old employee. I stopped working in the newsroom and I made the front of my house the farm a lot corporate campus. But uh, newspapers uh, started sliding downhill and so I took a buyout early on nine and um, there was a hiatus for a few months. I'd taken another job with a pink sheet uh, but then I got the rights to the site and uh, tried to sort out what was happening. It, it got a little um, complicated trying to figure out where to go next. Long story short, as they say, I ended up selling it to, because uh, I got in the rights, I had sold it to a private equity firm that has some other related titles. Private equity lives to buy and sell. A year ago, we all got sold to United Business Media, based in London, and um, that's uh, a little more than a year ago now. And uh, not including the hiatus, we're coming up on the five-year anniversary for the site. So where to from here? I feel like I've been riding a surfboard, just trying to, you know, avoid wiping out as all these changes occurred, you know, least of which is the economy and all the changes inside pharma. And um, I will say happily that uh, we're profitable this year. Pharma lot, you know, is profitable. And, you know, we have, you know, our, we have the sort of infrastructure that is what I envisioned uh, early on, but unfortunately got sidetracked because of all the other issues con confronting newspapers. So where to from here, though? I mean, we, I mentioned this because people should have a little background on how it got here and where it stands, but also um, the fact that we've been able to, to get to this point. Uh, I think the where to from here is, you know, to use marketing parlance, building out the brand. We've been doing webinars, do more of those, try to do some more podcasts, looking for other sort of sponsorship, co-sponsorship opportunities where the name can lend itself correctly. Um, I'm not turning into a salesman. I'm trying to make sure, though, that I preserve the integrity of the name as part of what I do. And But we have other people who can do the sorts of things that can help move that forward in that direction. Um, I'd like, you know, one day to see this become something bigger, you know, so I'm not just the other 
you know, the only person in that newsroom I mentioned, that conceptual newsroom. But, um, that, you know, that's going to take time. It's slow. But it's moving in the right direction. And, you know, if you'd asked me that two or three years ago, I would have said, boy, if we could get to that, the point I'm in now, I'd be thrilled. So, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's a challenge. The, 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 every day is a challenge. Some days I wake up, I have no clue what the heck I'm going to do. And when exactly is your five-year anniversary? Have you got big plans? Well, if you, if, you, if you discount that hiatus I mentioned for a few months in uh, 2009, January coming up will be the five-year mark. Uh, so I'll, I'll have to do something satirical. I just haven't figured out what it'll be yet. Ed, it's been great as always to catch up. Thank you so much for your time and good luck with Farm A Lot moving forwards. Oh, well, thanks for the interest. It was good seeing you too. And uh, let's stay in touch. We'll have to do this again at the, at the next five-year mark. Actually, when, you're, when your site turns five years. PharmaForum.com is the dynamic online information and discussion portal for the pharmaceutical industry.